lovely to see so many of you here and tonight Kat and myself are hoping to give you some information um, that hopefully will spark people's interests about laparoscopy. Kat joined the practice in 2000 and no, seven years ago, <laughs> seven years ago. Um, and then in 2006, she gained her certificate in small animal surgery, which is an additional qualification that you can choose to do, which gives her um, additional skills in surgery. She became a partner last <coughs> year, and she's going to start us off giving us an introduction and a brief history of laparoscopy. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'm not a natural speaker, so I'll, I'll try not to talk quickly or mumble That's too much, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I'll uh, try. So laparoscopy is something that we've started doing recently. I thought I would just introduce the topic. What is it? Where does it come from in the human side? So I'm, my 15 minutes is going to be more human-based, because it's actually quite interesting how long it's actually been going on in the human side, just to give a, a bit of a platform for Helen's talk. So what is laparoscopy? Well, it comes from the Greek word of looking inside the abdomen or the flank or the sort of tummy area with a scope or just trying to look inside. Um, there are lots of other words for it that get thrown around. People um, talk about keyhole surgery, minimally invasive surgery, endosurgery and video surgery. So those are things that are used quite <coughs> interchangeably when you read about it. Um, laparoscopy itself, the lapa sort of refers to the flank or the abdomen, so the lower region of your body, abdomen and pelvis. Um, thoracoscopy, thorax, is the chest, so looking at the top part of your body. Arthroscopy is within the joints, but they all fall under the general term of endoscopy. So again, to say what it is, um, so you're looking into the abdominal cavity or the tummy using an in, a rigid endoscope, which is sort of like a camera, just a, a way of looking into the abdomen. And you do it through really small little incisions like that, just enough to get your instruments in. You use maybe one to four in humans, little ports along the body, just to, to gain um, a way of getting your instruments in and your camera in. Um, and you also put um, carbon dioxide into the abdomen to sort of um, blow, you get blown up a bit like a balloon, really, <coughs> just so that you, when you've got your instruments in and your camera, um, the abdominal wall is actually lifted off the organ, so you can actually see what you're looking at. And that's called creating a pneumoperitoneum, which means air in the abdominal cavity. So as you can see on this, I didn't get bring a pointer, which is a bit annoying, but as you can see on that little <coughs> illustration there, you've got the abdominal wall here sort of elevated away from the organ. So you've filled that with gas, and then you can actually see what you're doing quite nicely. <laughs> Um, and why carbon dioxide? Initially, when it was started, and we'll see that when I go through a brief history, they used air, but actually carbon dioxide is um, readily absorbed by tissue. Um, the body, when you breathe, you get rid of carbon dioxide, and it's not flammable, which is really important in, in the operating theatre if you're using any kind of electrical tree or uh, electrical things, because uh, you don't want your patient to blow up, really. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally. <laughs> That's a bad end. So again, this is just, I thought I'd put in lots of pictures just to illustrate that rather than the surgeon sort of really operating over an animal, you've got this, you know, the surgeon very much standing away and looking on a screen and very little um, bleeding, blood loss and, and a very sort of stand back approach. So the laparoscope itself is a rigid telescopic rod lens system, which is quite a complicated um, system of, of lenses that create the image that you see. Um, and light goes down some glass fibres to illuminate the area that you're seeing. Actually, I'll go back one. The other thing um, that the laparoscope can be, you can look straight on in your field, but it can also be angled depending on which areas you want to reach in the body. The, um, so you've got your scope inside the body, which is then attached to um, a camera and a light source. You've got light source, um, so that you can see what you're doing. And it's typically halogen or xenon, which fall into the cold light spectrum, so the bluer lights. And then you've got the video camera um, attached to your scope, as in this picture here. So you see the scope, you've got a light source, and at the very top is the video camera that then goes to the screen so that the surgeon can see what they're doing. So in human surgery, 
It was traditionally started um, in gynecological procedures, so fallopian tube ligations, just having a general look, ovariectomies, tumours, that sort of thing. Um, and then gallbladder removal was started in the 80s, um, and now the vast majority, 96-97% of gallbladders are removed via laparoscopy in the US and um, in Europe, I believe it's the same. <coughs> Gastrointestinal procedures, one of the most common uses of laparoscopy is bariatric procedures, so gastric banding, very common, um, and small and large intestine, again, a way of looking and a way of treating tumours, very non-invasively. And pretty much anything, you can remove the appendix, you can um, do kidney removal and surgery, pancreas, spinal surgery, heart surgery, lung surgery. The advantages in, um, in human surgery, um, a big advantage is that you have a very quick recovery time. So you're getting your patients in and out, so you're minimising the time that they're spending in hospital. So that makes it very cost effective and good for the patients as well. There's less scarring, which is very important as well. There's less pain, and they are smaller incisions, obviously. For the surgeon, there's less intraoperative bleeding. You can see so much more because you're going in with the camera and looking all around the abdomen that you've inflated with this carbon dioxide. And because it's a quicker operation, you get less infections. But there are disadvantages as well. And then Callum will go more into this as well. It is technically much more difficult, a very steep learning curve. It's very counterintuitive because you're no longer seeing what you're doing. Your hands are attached to some instruments that are going opposite directions. And it's not quite intuitive, so it takes a little bit of learning. The equipment is very expensive. You don't have the tactility. Normally, when you're doing surgery, you can feel things and say, oh, that feels a bit hard, that doesn't feel right. But you're at the end of an instrument, so it's very hard to gauge how things feel. And humans complain of shoulder pain after laparoscopy. And I'm not entirely certain anyone really knows why that is. Some people talk about it being the spleen or the, the air diffusing. I'm not sure. I'm going to skip that because the YouTube is going slowly. Why, why did we start doing laparoscopy? I think doctors, surgeons have been interested in looking inside the human body. You know, we've got, we've got radiography, we can take x-rays, we can do CTs. But for, for ages, they've wanted to just have a look inside and see what's going on. Um, earliest recorded references to endoscopy <coughs> date back to Hippocrates, 4th century BC. Um, there have been instruments found in Roman ruins that look like the sort of instruments that we might use today. Um, and the first um, surgeon to use a light source um, to try and have a look to light up and see what was going on was uh, someone called Aranzi in 1585. And he focused sunlight through a flask of water. So this desire has been there, but we're just trying to get that technology. Like, how, how do we do it? How do we go about getting in there? <coughs> In 1806, Bazzini, he built an instrument, this instrument there called the Lichtleiter, um, and um, he used wax candles and mirrors to try and get an image of what was going on. It gets better. <laughs> Desormo, in 1866, used open, an open tube to examine the female reproductive tract, and he combined alcohol and turpentine with a flame in order to generate a bright light. Unfortunately, he burnt some of the patients as well at the same time. That's enough to stop me going to the gynecologist, isn't it? <laughs> Um, they wanted to put instruments down and look inside the stomach um, and so Kusmal decided that actually a good person to have a go at this was a sword swallower and at first I read that and I thought because he didn't do it himself but then I realised no, he, they meant because he could tolerate having, having things put down his gullet <laughs> and here we see um, Georg Kelling he did the first laparoscopy in a dog and he's the first one who really said right in order to be able to see anything, we need to blow this abdomen up. We need to remove the abdominal wall away from the organ so we can take a look. And Hans Christian Jacobius, a Swede, I haven't mentioned that, um, he did the first laparoscopy in humans. And then through the history, there's lots of people who start contributing um, throughout the two world wars. Um, the development sort of halted for a few years, as can be understood. Um, but there are a few people who are quite, quite key. Heinz Kalk was the founder of the German School of Laparoscopy, and they mostly used it for diagnosis, so having a look, seeing what they could see. Um, and he did, he did liver biopsies as well. And I think he recorded something like 2,000 liver biopsies in the publication. Um, and Bosch was um, Swiss, and he did the first fallopian tube ligation. So again, we've got people wanting to do it. Things are being invented all the time, but there's inadequate technology. So. At first, we're at a time when there's not even barely the light bulb has been invented, um, and now we've got some light. So this is a, a laparoscope here. So the surgeon would be looking down here, but they've got a little light bulb at the end there. So you can imagine that would get very hot inside a 
if we were looking inside an abdomen, so in order to increase the light, they would then burn the patient. So there was a real delicate balance between trying to get it right. <laughs> the other problem they had was in trying to um, inflate the abdomen with air, putting a needle into the abdominal cavity, they would sometimes perforate um, some of the um, organs. So this Janos Veres, who worked with um, who worked with tuberculosis patients actually, um, initially to try and get air into the lung cavity, um, developed this safe needle that as soon as it doesn't feel resistance, you get a, a blood troker at the end. And you can see an example of that on our table afterwards. We still use the breast needle every day when we do laparoscopy. So he was quite an important chap. When you look into this history, you get quite, if, if it's a procedure you're doing, you get quite interested in the, the names of the procedures and the instruments. You go, well, who, who invented that and how did they think of that? And you start thinking, well, that was 1938. That's quite, that's quite interesting. One of the big companies um, in endoscopy is Stortz, and Carl Stortz was a real person. Um, and him and Harold Hopkins, they were both instrumental in um, discovering fibre optics and the rod lens telescope, which is you know, the telescopes that we use today, so the rod lens system, so a way of getting a very clear view and also being able to illuminate our field. So that was a real key in the 50s and 60s. And this fella here, Kurt um, now regarded as a pioneer um, in laparoscopy. Initially, he started doing, um, taking appendixes out, um, and the um, German Medical Society thought he was absolutely crazy and thought he should be struck off, and he was shunned, and then 10 years later, they said, wow, isn't he great, and is it wonderful that we have such a wonderful German doctor? And he was very much a pioneer. He did lots and lots and lots of surgery. So as I keep saying, we've got <coughs> Mr. Hayes. <laughs> We've got technology lagging behind desire to do more laparoscopically. So we're still at this stage where you've got the surgeon looking down a scope and trying to do something with, with his or her other hand. I shouldn't say his, that's terrible. Um, and, and so really very, very awkward still. You can see it, but, but we, have, we need a way to get it onto these wonderful new televisions that have been invented. 1986 um, was a pivotal moment when they discovered the computer chip television camera. Um, I have no idea how that works, but it just means that we can screw a nice little camera onto our scope and it appears on a screen, which is the first time that that ever happened, that you could actually free up your hand and you could actually look on a screen and see what was going, and that made a massive difference. So now you've gone from the situation at the top to the situation at the bottom. So there the surgeon is struggling to do everything at once, and at the bottom they're all quite happily doing it on the screen. Again, mostly gynecological procedures to start with, um, but another thing that was invented was um, an automatic stapler, so that if you had to tie off some blood vessels, that you could actually have a clip loaded with 20 into it, rather than having to pull in, go in, go out, and worry about bleeding during your surgery. So I think I mentioned this before, about 96 to 97% of gallbladders are now removed laparoscopically. Um, but um, the first laparoscopic gallbladder removal was done in 1985. It only took five years for it to become a gold standard. And if you think about it, it's a 20 centimetre incision to have it done standard versus some little, little incisions like that. Now I've had laparoscopy, and I don't think I, I don't think I fancy an open, open surgery. Um, laparoscopy is a much quicker recovery time. Um, it's become a very competitive subspecialty with various fields in surgery and surgical residents now spend time, if they want to do lap, um, laparoscopy or, or use um, that sort of technology, they spend a lot of time training. In humans, oh, we haven't got to this in, uh, in, in the veterinary field yet, but the next stage is now using robotics. So it started with trying to, you know, surgeons maybe get a bit shaky and they're not as accurate, so how can we steady it, how can we free up the surgeon? They started with a single robotic arm and then the Da Vinci system, which is one of the <laughs> sort of real pioneers of a, you know, massive things in, in the robotics, was approved in, in 2000 by the Food and Drug Administration and it has this console, you can see the chap at the front, he's sitting in a sort of PlayStation type and he's operating all those arms in the background, so it means you're away from the patient. But the other thing with the Da Vinci is rather than just having, you can just, normally when you're doing it, you can only move in certain dimensions, but the Da Vinci robot can move in all lots of different ways, so you get incredible accuracy. They call it the master-slave concept, so we think of robotics as a robot's doing something of his own, but it's not, they're only doing what the surgeon tells them to. And it enhances the safety of surgeon's movements and increases the accuracy. <coughs> and there it is in training. They do also, there's, there's, Loads of YouTube videos of the Da Vinci robot doing lots and lots of different things. 
In 2001, there was the first transatlantic gallbladder removal. So someone in New York operated on a patient in Strasbourg through high-speed fiber optics. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Someone's seen across the world. We hope you don't get time today. <laughs> what did you do that for? What did you say? <laughs> it's bleeding. So where are we at? Minimally invasive surgery. So through the ages, we've been trying to look inside the body. Um, we've come up with ways of being able to look, blowing up the abdomen, um, <coughs> getting the light source in there, getting the camera on there. Computer-assisted surgery, robotics, um, and also remote surgery. Where, where's it going to end? Right now, there's talk, you know, one of the advantages of the remote surgery is you can, in a time of, a time of war zone battles, you can have one surgeon sitting safely somewhere operating um, a robot somewhere in the battlefield. Um, under developed countries, you can have one where they can't afford lots of surgeons. You can have one well-trained surgeon sitting in a central hospital operating robotics, lots of different places. And then the new experimental thing is natural orifice transluminal surgery, where you wouldn't actually have any external scars. You would actually maybe swallow a little robot into your tummy, and then they'd anesthetize you nicely, and then they would tell that robot what to do, and maybe cut through through your stomach and go into the body and, and take it off. And so who knows where it's going to end, really? <laughs> And I'll end, I'll finish my little bit, because you get to bit into your thing, with the Da Vinci robot peeling a grape. And da Vinci invented the first robot, that's why they called it the Da Vinci system. I didn't know that. Leonardo? Yeah, apparently. That's what it said on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the company claims. Well, that's what the company claims. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time, because this is my... It is very, very precise. I don't think we'll be getting one of these, do we? <laughs> There's um, YouTube videos of people playing, you know, the children game operation, which I played with myself, with, with the robot of actually being much more accurate with the robot than humans are actually doing it. You can see someone sitting, controlling it, very fine movements. And now the Wi Fi is playing up. Yes, like it's not picking up a great one. No, it might not work. It always falls down on technology. Right, maybe we'll give up on the YouTube. <laughs> You get the idea.